Hello, everyone. Another week has passed. We're heading into another week here at the School of the East. So today's lesson, as I look at my trusty uh, calendar, is set for October the 24th. Remember, we had a holiday thrown in there a couple of weeks ago. So this is for Monday the 24th. Again, it's a mix of creative writing and uh, poetry. So let me uh, get into this. Some of the material, minimize myself. Goodbye. It's down. All right. Start the slideshow. And then from the beginning. ENG 102, creative writing. And then technically it's the third week of assignments, okay, with a holiday thrown in. Okay. So here we go. Chapter three, the novel. Okay. We spoke about the short story last week. So today I'm going to get into the uh, novel. Okay. Okay, from Don, uh, Don Quixote, okay, to The Great Gatsby. These are two very famous uh, novels. Great novels capture or take your imagination and take you into a world all their own. So that's what good novels are supposed to do. You're supposed to sit there as you start to read and say, well, I'm in Koreatown at the Starbucks. And there's a lot of traffic out there, and it's noisy, and it's a rainy day. But once you start reading, suddenly, like with Don Quixote, you're in Spain 400 years ago, okay? Or The Great Gatsby, you're in 1920s uh, United States, like New York, and everybody's partying and going crazy. They capture your imagination and take you into a world all their own, okay? Although you've probably heard of the main genres or themes, romance, mystery, science fiction, fantasy, thriller, not to be confused with Michael Jackson's thriller. You guys might even be too young for that. Uh, literary and Western, you might not know that there are also countless subgenres. Sub means like not as popular or less as less known themes like the historical romance so I guess that might be something like um, couples falling in love during the civil war you know and then cross genres so genres are themes that cross like science fiction romance okay there's a lot of science fiction movies out there but not uh, most of them don't have romance they have aliens right that's the main theme so here we go, a novel definition. To 19th century writer Ambrose Bierce, the novel was simply a short story padded. So padded means you add extra things to it, okay? So basically it's a short story, with a couple of things added. If you already write short stories or novellas, uh, thinking about a novel in those terms can help to take away some of the doubt and fear you may be having if you are considering this kind of undertaking, or this is fancy English that just means if you're considering writing a novel, when they say this kind of undertaking. So while it is absolutely true that writing a novel is no easy task or job, best-selling crime author Mary Higgins Clark characterized the first four months of writing one of her novels as scratching with my hands through granite. So granite is like a, I'll make it easy for it. It's like cement. So imagine it was so tough for her to start this novel that it felt like trying to scratch through concrete. So like what this uh, school is made of, the East, go outside and the strong uh, concrete like granite. How long would it take you to Put your nails through that <laughs> forever. 
So approaching the novel as simply another form or telling a story may be just the incentive you need. So incentive means something that gives you the desire to have action and do it, right? Uh, a man might love his girlfriend and she wants to get married, but he's afraid. So what's gonna give him the incentive to marry her? If she says, well, if you don't, you know, marry me, I'm gonna leave you for another man. So that usually makes the guy buy the ring, right? So if you have a lot you want to say and need some room in which to say it, the novel may be right for you, meaning you could be a novelist. Be courageous, be strong, and read on. Novels which currently attract more writers than any other literary form are believed to have come into existence around 1200 BC. It's a long time ago. Even older than me, if you can believe it. Okay, two, as we continue, two notable examples from Egypt at that time are the predestined prince and Sinube. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know if that's actually Egyptian. Uh, following a number of novel-like stories written in Japanese in the early part of the first millennium, including most notably the tale of Genji, stories that eventually became the Arabian Nights Entertainment or the Thousand and One Nights were begun all during various times in the past, many, many years ago. These stories were eventually established as a group between the 14th and 16th centuries and were read widely in Europe, which means all over. Uh, Starbucks are spread widely throughout the throughout Los Angeles. So, you know, they're in Santa Monica, they're in Cape Town, they're in Island Park, you name it. So they were read widely in Europe early in the 18th century. In 1605, Miguel Cervantes published the first part of Don Quixote. By the time Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe came into the world in 1719, the modern novel had come into its own. By the end of that century, it had become a major literary form. While there are several elements that are key to every type of novel, theme, characters, plot, setting, and dialogue, different authors have different ways of mixing these ingredients together. Some lean on a storyline, which then determines the characters that will populate it. So that means that they will make a storyline first and then they'll try to find characters that uh, fit that storyline, okay? So if they're gonna do a police drama, they're gonna have to try to find characters that are policemen and then some characters that are obviously criminals, right? Okay. Others begin with a character or two in mind. So some people do it, some writers do it the opposite way. You have strong images of characters and then develop a story to wrap around them. So maybe that would be something maybe if we look at science fiction, like they're going to write about Batman versus Superman, right? So there's so much information about Batman and Superman. Then they just have to think, well, what would be a good story to build or wrap around these characters. So two different ways of doing the same thing. Some can't stop thinking about a particular piece of conversation. Perhaps an angry exchange between a police officer and a motorist that they overheard. And that becomes the impetus or starting point for their story. Believe it or not, you probably won't believe it, but um, Jesus, I guess this was, I hate to say it, the 1980s, 
um, there was a movie that I think won the Oscar, and the storyline was just two mature men having dinner in a restaurant and having a conversation. Sounds pretty boring to me, but. And I didn't see the movie, but I guess a lot of people enjoyed it. And that movie was called My Dinner with Andre. So, hey, your stories can start from many different points. Other writers experience an event or a place that sets their inventive minds in motion. The elements of a novel can come together in many different ways, but it's necessary that every element be strong and work smoothly with all the others. So now we're going to specify now, get into some specification. What's your theme, right? Meaning you, 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 possibly future writers. Early in your writing, you'll want to think about your novel's focus or theme. What is the purpose of your tale or story? What is the main point? Every novel has a theme, which is either stated, which means you, you, you point it out in your novel, or more often unveiled along with the story. So what they mean unveiled along with the story is kind of like, you know what like a horror movie? Uh, okay, so you know that the, the movie is about uh, some kind of monster, right? So you'll never see the monster's face or complete body in the beginning of the movie. You know, they'll show you a tail or a foot and then time goes by, maybe the back. So as the story moves along, eventually towards the end, you will see the full monster, right? And that's the same with your theme, a lot of writers. Uh, just give you bits and pieces of the theme to make you guess what's going on. Often the theme involves an insight about relationships, which is a, you know, inside information looking point, or about life that the characters in the story discover through situations they encounter and the ways they react to them. For example, in William Styron's Lie Down in Darkness, a novel about a young girl and her difficult family who face great pain and tragedy. The theme is that love must endure if people are to endure. So I guess, you know, you run out of love and people don't have a lot to live for at that point and they might not live that long. That's why they using the term endure here. John Hassler's wonderful novel, North of Hope, centers on a priest who goes home after 20 years of missionary work to find there are few believers left in town, as well as people he loved facing problems at every turn. The theme here, the reader discovers by the book's end, is that faith of varying kinds or different kinds can see people through their greatest despair. So that means you could have the worst problems in the world, but for a lot of people, what makes them survive these terrible situations is their faith in God. Okay. All right. So next, how do you decide on a theme? A theme may already be roaming or floating around in the back of your mind. Or there may be an issue important to you that you don't yet realize is a theme, but actually is one. Again, as you roll these ideas in your brain, you might not realize. Like one of the first ideas you get, no, 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 that's not a theme. And as you keep on going and get frustrated and, like she said, try to put your fingers through the concrete then you actually realize, oh no, that first one I thought about, I, that's a theme, yay. So be patient, folks, be patient. For example, you may have a child who plays in the local soccer league and her team has never won a game. But your daughter just loves getting up on Saturday mornings to meet her teammates and play as hard as she can. And she loves the big pancake 
breakfast that your family shares after every game. That's kind of like, a, that's what's called team camaraderie. And you know, they're talking about a kid here, but that doesn't change as you get older. If you watch videos about, you know, professional football players or baseball players, and, you know, the guy's retired for the last 10 years and they say, hey, what do you miss about the game, you know? And uh, the guy made all this money and what have you. And most of these guys will tell you they don't miss the fame or the money or the people cheering. They miss the camaraderie with their teammates. They love having these guys as close, close friends. And that's usually what goes on in society. Uh, you really admire how she gives her sport her all. That girl, good for her. Even though it's clear she's not going to end up with a trophy or a plaque. Here you can find a theme for a novel. Winning isn't everything, right? If she's not on a winning team, but she just loves to be with her friends and compete. All right, themes are all around you people, so keep your eyes and ears open. Check your personal life. Check your beliefs. Check the newspaper, even if you have to do that online. Have you recently read about a fire that caused dozens of strangers to help the victim? Your novel could revolve around the point that disaster can bring out the best in people. Like all the people who helped and some people that gave their lives trying to help 9-11, right? That was the best in people from all backgrounds. Or maybe you know about a young couple who went through endless struggles to adopt an orphan. A terrific example of love conquers all. They love this baby that was not even theirs. Beautiful story. As you think of different themes, jot them down, which means write them down, and consider them. Like I said, go back to them. You'll be surprised. Which one really resonates or sounds to you good? Which one feels like the right one for conveying something that's important to you. You probably won't want to actually write the words anywhere in your story, but by settling on a theme, you'll give your novel direction and purpose and have the basis for your characters, setting, and plot. And that's pretty good. That's uh, three big points right off the bat. Themes often involve abstract ideas. Okay, abstract ideas are things that you, it is most difficult, if not sometimes impossible to fully explain, right? So the following list is based on Merrill Goddard's What Interest People and Why. So here's some abstract ideas. Love. So you like love. Uh, there's all kinds of different love in how you love might be different than how somebody else loves, right? How Temujin loves is different than how Tall loves, right? So it's abstract. You can't, it's not a one word answer. And the same with hate, right? And then you have fear. Various levels of fear, you know? Uh, some people have, let's say, for example, uh, some people have a high level of fear of going to the dentist. And believe me, I've been to the dentist in my life, and that's one of the least popular things uh, that I would like to do. If someone told me I never would have to go to the dentist again in my life, I'd be very happy. But I know it's not uh, as big of a fear for me that if I was in the middle of the ocean, that a shark might come and kill me, that would be a stronger fear because the sharks are everywhere and I'm in the middle of the ocean. How am I going to survive, right? And then there's vanity where um, a man or a woman seem to love themselves more than anybody else can, right? It's the opposite of what Regular people do looking for love and hoping somebody finds them and loves them. 
they already love themselves so much that it's like they almost don't need other people to uh, give them any type of affection. Okay, then there's wrongdoing. Again, there's different levels of wrongdoing, and then there's morality. Okay. Morality might be different from the aspect of a religious person to a what we call a secular person or a person without any kind of religion. Okay, then we have selfishness. So we all know about that. Don't touch my donut. Uh, next, immortality, living forever, superstition. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we were taught as kids, when you walk on the sidewalk, not to, you know, the sidewalk is, they're built like squares, right? One square, two square, three squares. Yeah. So there's lines. They would say, if you step on one of those lines, which is a crack, you know, step on a crack, break your mother's back. So myself included, we used to jump over those uh, lines because we thought we'd come home and our mother's back would be broken. Okay, next, uh, curiosity. We have an old saying, curiosity killed the cat. A lot of times cats get themselves killed by looking and going into places they should not, but they can't stop themselves. And there's veneration, which is maybe liking someone or something too much. And ambition. Ambition has killed people also or ruined their lives when they have too much ambition. They get a little success and it's just not enough. They want to get more and more. And there's culture. Everybody has a different culture. So you can see the differences there. Heroism. Uh, different people think different ways on what it means to be a hero. Then there's discovery, if you know about that discovering a cure with medicine and then amusement what some people find amusing or fun other people uh, do not okay and vice versa now we move on about characters when you create characters you want to make sure they're believable i would make a point there and enjoyable even if they're bad guys it helps to the story it's very popular recently where when i was a kid bad guys were just 100 percent bad Really the last 20 years, it's like a lot of people like bad characters because they've got points about their character that people say, oh, it's pretty cool. Uh, flat main characters, those with no shape, those you only describe in one dimension, such as physical appearance, can't carry a book. So they can't make the book interesting for a long time. No matter how strong the plot or theme, undeveloped characters will leave the reader feeling bored, confused, or both. Characters, of course, don't have to be people. Interesting. They can be robots, AI, or animals, or toadstools, or ghosts. Toadstool is like a giant mushroom. But whoever or whatever they are, they have to come across as real. They have to be believable. And as you're bringing your characters to life, try to think of them as actual people, even the toadstool or the ghost or robots or whatever, with a history, a personality, and a will of their own. Very important information there. Next, type of characters or characters. Okay. Most novels contain two types of characters, major and minor. Important point there, hint, hint. Major characters are the ones we learn all about and grow to love or hate. They're complex, convincing personalities with a paralyzing fear of dogs and a weakness for Belgian chocolates. They're being funny here. They are impatient, driving a car, and happiest when at the beach. They're in most or all of the novel scenes and are the focus of the plot. They are the characters we can't wait to encounter again. When we happily curl up with the book, we can hardly stand to put down. I'll skip the little E fact. Uh, the following list, which is by no means inclusive, which means has everything, provides some excellent examples of successfully written and memorable main characters. Red Butler in Gone with the Wind, Hannibal Lecter, 
in Silence of the Lambs. The Whale in Moby Dick, the big white whale. Charles Ryder in Bride's Head Revisited. Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars series. Mr. Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. Catherine in Withering Heights. Minor characters, as their name implies, receive much less attention. Implies it means suggest. Some such small roles that we hardly get to know them at all. They uh, populate the pages just to bring tea or to give travel directions or be a clerk in a shop when a main character comes in. But some minor characters can play a bigger part. Supporting a main character in something he's trying to accomplish or acting as his opposite to point out his features and flaws. Minor characters can also be used to propel or push forward the plot. For example, the novelist may supply a victim or the villain in order to show us how bad the villain really is. For characters like this, you'll need to develop a fairly complete profile so that readers come to know at least a good number of things about them. Right. So you want to make the and supply as much detail about your characters as you can. Then we have the plot line, that's like the skeleton of the story. The characters in a novel can't exist in a vacuum, like, like nothingness, that's what they mean. To become concrete or solid, three-dimensional people to readers, they must be placed into situations that let them act and react, move forward and backward, learn, live, and grow. In other words, they need a plot. They need something to happen to them. Just like your life. You just don't stand there as a person. You know, Mr. Honga stands there 24 hours a day. No, he has a life. And all these things that happen in his life, it's like the plot line. Plots and novels run the gamut. And then some. But most have five essential elements to the plot. Hint, hint. Number one, the introduction of characters. Two, a triggering event that disrupts the life of the main character and sets the story in motion. Often trigger event causes conflict or a problem that the main character must resolve. Three, a series of events that the main character goes through on the way to solving the problem. Four, a climax or moment of great intensity when the main character either succeeds or fails at overcoming the problem. Five, an anticlimax or resolution in which calm returns to the main character's life. The plot is the story and the elements are its structure. If you think about novels you've read, you can probably identify their structure or the plot points as they're sometimes called. Think about the Charles Dickens classic Oliver Twist. One. The introduction. At the beginning, you meet Oliver as a baby. His just dead mother, the parish beetle Bumble, her name was Bumble, and the other characters who inhabit the poor farm where the orphan Oliver is sent to live. Two, the trigger event. An older, hungry Oliver makes the dreadful mistake of asking for a second bowl of porridge and is sent away to work for a casket maker where he is badly mistreated. Three, the events. Oliver runs off, joins a gang of young thieves who work for a master thief called Fagin. Gets caught in his first attempt as a pickpocket. He's taken home and cared for by the man whose pocket he tried to pick. He is recaptured by Fagin, shot, taken in by the people whose house he tried to walk, rob, Stalked by Fagin and reunited with his first benefactor. Wow, what a childhood. Four, the climax. The girlfriend of one of the thieves overhears a plot between Fagin and a man named Monks to keep secret Oliver's true identity. Oliver is the son of his benefactor's late best friend and to keep Oliver from getting the money he should have inherited. The girlfriend is killed 
the thief hangs himself, and Fagan is hanged after revealing where the papers are that prove Oliver's heritage. Wow. Yeah. The, finally, the anticlimax. Oliver is adopted by his benefactor, receives his inheritance, and lives happily ever after. That's pretty good. More on dialogue. Dialogue is just as important in a novel as it is in a short story. In addition to unveiling characters, dialogue reveals and furthers the plot line. For example, dialogue is a particularly effective device in crime and suspense novels. From the interaction and exchange of characters, bits of the story are intricately woven together. Bad guys and good guys actually tell you how and where things are going as they talk to each other and themselves. Crime novels often contain a good deal of dialogue because it links the many people and actions they are key, or excuse me, that are key to solving the crime. Good dialogue must be clear, believable, natural, so you don't want to sound like a robot, not too long, right? you can overtalk, unpredictable, forceful, and snappy one-two liners. That's some tall order. But just think about exchanges you've read and enjoyed that made you stop to think about or savor what was said. You know who is talking. You understand what they say. They speak in a way that suits and illustrates their character. Right? You don't want a guy that's supposed to have not gone to school to sound like some highly educated person with a master's degree. They have to sound like their character. They speak the way real people speak with some long, complete sentences, some sentence fragments, some O's and well's like, oh man, or well this. They sometimes say outrageous things or get excited or angry or sad. They speak to the point and they're not boring. The biggest thing you gotta avoid. Important details. Perhaps the most vital part of writing poetry is the use of significant detail. Does that mean we've slipped into the poetry now? Yay. Hope you caught that. Your poems will describe your mother's calloused hand, your dog's warm, soft face, the smell of your grandmother's apple pie, or the colors of a sunset through your window. Any topic that inspires you to write. So to share your work with a circle of readers, you must describe each of these central images in a way that makes them come alive. Your readers should be able to see, hear, taste, feel, or smell exactly what your words describe. Wow, you will be a good writer if you can do those things. I can smell your writing. The five senses. From the moment you are born, you learn about the world using your five senses. As a child, you make a lot of discoveries. But even as you grow older, you continue to delight or become happy in objects that appeal to your senses. The smell of a fresh brewed coffee, that makes a lot of people happy. The feel of a warm sweater, I guess on a cold day. The melody of a favorite song. You know, whatever that is. Oh, my song, oh, do, 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 do. That's your favorite song. Uh, or you like BTS. Keeping these things in mind, you should try to appeal to your reader's senses and with the details you include in your poetry. Sight. You use your eyes to examine the physical environment around you. You learn how close or how far people and objects are. You learn how small or large these objects are, what colors they are, and what shapes they take. Your first impressions of people, places, and things often depend upon your first sight of them. It's true, the first impression, right? Sight also dictates or forces or shows a lot of decisions you make. In part, you might choose a car because of how it looks, 
and most young guys do it that way. That they, they don't, especially if it's used, they don't look at the miles or the damage. Oh, it's a beautiful red car. It looks cool. Next, an outfit for the way it complements your figure. That might be ladies. You know, oh, I look so green. I'll buy it. And how much is it? Five hundred dollars. Ooh, boyfriend, can you buy this for me? Or mate, a uh, possible wife or husband, based on physical attraction only, not getting to know the person's personality. Question, how do you appeal to a reader's sense of sight in a poem? You do this by, you don't simply write, he is tall, right? That gets in their mind, he is tall, but different people, you know, like let's say, a girl that's five foot two says, okay, he's tall. Okay, that means he's almost six feet tall. But then a man reading it who's actually six feet tall, that's his size. So six feet tall is not tall. So he has a, he's thinking of something else. You have to be more descriptive. So you use size, shape, color, and any other visual cues. Instead, right, he ducked his head, which means he lowered his head, covered with a blue ball cap, like a Dodger cap, and twisted his soldiers' shoulders, not soldiers, am I in the army today? To the left, just barely fitting through the dwarf door frame. So that's a pretty tall dude, like a shack that can't just walk normally through a door, has to duck his head and twist his body to try to get through. So you have an idea how tall that person really is. That's not a six footer, even though you're only five foot two. Okay. Likewise, your sense of sight also determines the way you decorate your home. Interesting. The art you choose, the carpet you select, and the colors you paint your walls are all efforts to make yourself feel more comfortable in your living space. Additionally, you would be trying to attract and impress guests with the decorations you choose. Think of the poems you write in a similar way. You are trying to create an environment for your reader by describing visible details, such as the color of a cup, coffee cup or the stillness of a lake. Your reader will be prompted to use his own sense of sight as he imagines the scene of your poem in his mind. Sound. So physical description is very important when creating a poem. Sound details can further heighten or increase a reader's experience. Not only do sound help, that should be does. They made a mistake here, but I caught it. Okay. Not only does sound help, or, or I guess they're saying sounds. Okay, can you not? So, not only do sounds help a reader experience the scene of a poem in her mind, but they are also important when a poem is being read or recited aloud. So just don't say, you know, he was shot at by the police. Try to include those pop, pop, bang, bang, those sounds. Give it more believability. Grab the attention of the reader. In addition to the vision of a red car going by, the reader should also, you just don't say red car going by. The reader should hear the whizzing or roaring sound it makes as it passes. Rear, rawr, right? As the car goes by. So you really can almost feel and hear the speed. Because you, if you just say a red car went by, it's like, did it go by slowly? Did it go by fast? You know? Just as size, color, and shape create vision, so do pitch tone and volume create sound, giving the reader the information she needs to learn about a poem's environment. For example, you may mention a woman's voice, but is the sound high-pitched and harsh or deep and delicate, or as we say, husky, is it a husky woman's voice? You just say a woman's voice was heard. Well, what kind of voice? To create convincing sounds in your poetry, you need to be aware of the sounds that fill the air around you. Does your keyboard clack clack or tick tick when you type on it? Tick tick sounds like an old typewriter. 
you guys probably don't remember typewriters. Uh, does the water leaking from a pipe in your house trickle down the wall or splatter on the floor? Does the wind whoosh through the oak tree in your front yard? Or does it gently hiss? The cats do that. They hiss. These seemingly small distinctions will help your reader imagine the scene you're constructing. Yeah, like you wouldn't want to write, the cat made a noise. Well, what the hell? What kind of noise, right? Don't be so vague. Smell. Here we get to the smell. This might be the trickiest part with the smell. Unless you rub your written pages with garlic, right? To give it a smell. All right, your sense of smell directly connects the outer world to the most primitive or basic portions of your brain. Uh, I just read something in psychology today, believe it or not. We had mentioned something earlier in this writing about people just you know, being a, picking a, a, a boyfriend or girlfriend just because the guy's really handsome or the girl's uh, really pretty. Not getting to know the personality. When I read in psychology today, a big thing subconsciously now, you don't think about it. Why people pick a certain boyfriend or girlfriend is because subconsciously they like their smell. Interesting, huh? And now we're talking about smell. So deep down inside, your boyfriend must smell good to you. As a result, your strongest memories are often associated with smells and frequently triggered by them. Triggered means like activated. By using strong scent description, you can make a poem an even more personal experience for your reader if you can get them to smell it. How do we do that? Let's find out. To practice identifying and describing smells, do some cooking. As you stir cookie dough or saute potatoes, choose three words to describe the aromas of the food you're preparing. You can do a similar exercise anywhere. If you're walking through a park in autumn, try to describe the smell of fallen leaves or the smoke rising from a chimney. Yeah, so instead of saying, oh, and I looked in the distance and smoke was rising from the chimney, you can say, as I watched smoke rising from the chimney, I noticed that it had a certain bacon type smell to it. So I wondered if they were cooking pork, right? So that gives you more and more information for your mind to enjoy. Uh, keep a list of these words and refer to them as you write your poetry. If you walk into a friend's home and smell pumpkin pie, you might remember with perfect clarity a bright November morning in your mother's kitchen as she prepared a Thanksgiving feast because you smelled that pumpkin pie. If you pass a construction site and smell sawdust, it could trigger a memory of your father's workshop. You'll immediately envision or imagine the floor covered in wood shavings and an oak rocking chair in mid-creation, which means he was making it. If you identify these essential details of the moments you are trying to recreate, then your poems will be that much more uh, believable. Yeah, so like if you're, you know, let's say you're talking, it says here the example is pumpkin pie. So, you can give that more and more believability, as you said. I walked into my friend's home and I smelled the pumpkin pie. Okay, now, some people have had this experience. Some have only bought their pumpkin pies at Ralph's or Vaughn's. So if you say, ooh, the strong smell of cloves, which is one of the ingredients in uh, making a pumpkin pie, and then another one, and you say is balanced by the, the soft smells of um, nutmeg, which people also put in the pumpkin pie. Now you're really bringing out a possible memory for someone because 
you bake that stuff and you can really smell the ingredients. All right. Yeah. So again, the bottom line here is to make your poems much more believable. That's the bottom line. Okay, touch. Unlike sight and sound and smell, the sense of touch requires your body to be in physical contact with the things you perceive, thinking about, or trying to understand. Your sense of touch perceives temperature, pressure, and pain, but it also alerts you or warns you to the more intimate feelings like love. Is that true? Have you ever touched a woman's hand and felt love? I don't think you can feel love from a cheeseburger from McDonald's, but you know, human being, that's a different story. A pat on the back from a parent, a kiss from a spouse, oh dear, a kiss. These are physical acts that reveal a level of contact between two people. Describing these sensations can make a poem more real to your reader. For example, show your reader the warm, smooth stroke of a parent's palm on your back or the cushioned softness of a pair of lips reaching out for a kiss. But don't get too crazy, you know, don't, Tamujin, don't say like, she gave me a kiss and it felt like fire and my soul was burning. You know, that's a little too much, okay? Okay, now we got an e-alert here. Um, alert. Be careful not to force all five senses into every poem you write. Yeah, don't try to just, I gotta put every sense. No, put them where they need to be, or as they say, appropriate. Poetry does not have to follow a recipe or a mathematical formula, which is great. It gives you more availability for free expression. Only include details that will help your reader experience the subject matter. Too many details can negate or stop one another or cancel one another. The imagery you select must be natural to the poem's purpose. So that, that's why I was telling you, uh, don't say she kissed me and it felt like fire and my soul was burning. You know, it's like, a, let's make it a little more believable. Okay? Unless her lips were on fire. I don't know. Where's that arrow? Okay. One way to come up with touch descriptions is to use your fingertips. Your fingertips are very sensitive and will give you the most acute or sharp sensations when touching objects. So if you're trying to describe the skin of a peach, touch it with your fingertips instead of the palm of your hand. The descriptions you choose through this method will probably be more intense and realistic than those you would use otherwise. So get your fingertips ready, folks. Taste. The sense of taste is highly connected to the ten, uh, sense of smell. So much so that I've been told or I've read where if you, let's say you're blindfolded um, and they close your nose with tape, they say when you eat something, you can't taste it because your nose is not actually smelling it. That's what I've been told. You can do that if you want. Give it a try. See if that's true. When you smell a pie baking in the oven, your taste buds and salivary glands are aroused. These reactions set in motion an entire chain of reactions in the digestive tract. Upon smelling food, your body is already preparing itself to digest it. Once you actually taste the food, you experience one of the most intense sensations possible. Eating delicious foods is pleasurable, and you want to provide your readers uh, with the same pleasure when reading your poem. Wow, that's great. Great metaphor. Because the sense of taste works inside the mouth, it has to be used thoughtfully. Again, be careful. Don't overuse. In other words, you don't go out of your way to include taste sensations within a poem. 
simply to broaden the reach of your sensory details. However, certain emotional and physical states like fear or sickness can bring a taste to the mouth, like the ever-present acidy bile that comes out of your gallbladder when you're so afraid of something. Describing these um, states might be more effective way of capturing them than simply writing, she felt sick. Instead, write something like, the taste of sickness filled her mouth like a thousand dirty pennies as she watched the giant worm moving inside the sink. Wow, how big was that worm? But a dirty penny sounds to me like a rust taste, you know, very rusty brown taste. That's pretty cool. Next, abstract versus concrete. Imagine you are walking through a fine art gallery. Perhaps you will see a painting comprised of distorted shapes and colors, and it will remind you of the anger you recently felt during an argument with a friend. Or a painting of a woman in a boat may resonate with you because you enjoy boating in your spare time. Either painting is better than the other, but each stimulates a different part of your psyche. One is abstract, and the other is concrete. You can use these two concepts in your poetry, depending on which kind of emotion you want to express or what response you want to generate in your reader. Using concrete nouns and verbs. Nouns and verbs are the most important parts of speech because you must use them to create complete sentences, right? Like you always can catch a beginner, there's no verb, right? You have to have a verb. The verb shows the action of the sentence. It's not a, sent a complete sentence without a verb. If you use nouns and verbs that do not work as hard as they should, you will have listless. Listless means like no life. Images in your poems. For example, the words double axle personnel transport vehicle can mean almost anything with two axles. So you can understand what it is. Car, truck a tank, a plane, a bicycle, or even a skateboard, okay? Careful what you use. The word car is more concrete, but still may lead to confusion. Mention the word car to 20 adults, and one will think of a Corvette, one will think of an SUV, one will think of a Toyota Camry. If you want your readers to envision one car specifically, then you must include much more detail, starting with a concrete now. Frank drove a blue Lexus ES with gold rally stripes, gold rims, a white leather interior, a 10-speaker Bose 200-watt tuner, tinted windows, and a six-speed manual V8 engine. That's very detailed. Now, each reader can visualize the car the same way. No confusion. An important effect to note is that once the car has been described, the readers can begin to form ideas about Frank. One can tentatively speculate what Frank does for a living, how much money he earns, and where he might live, and so on, all from this simple description of the car. So what they're basically saying there is you cannot be a poor guy and have this kind of car, right? Yeah, you can realize almost what is his e uh, economic level. Another example highlights the need for strong verbs. In the sentence, she made her way across the room the reader gains a sense that the character is moving through a crowd of people, but the verb is too vague to really show her movement. What kind of movement? How is she making her way through this room? If a more concrete verb were used, the sentence would be more engaging or catching your attention. For example, she slithered through a sea of people to the other side of the room. If you don't know slithering, that's the way a snake moves. So that's how she, she moved between people like a snake. She slithered. Active and passive voice verbs. Verbs can be used in an active or passive voice. And the voice of the verb tells you the relationship between the verb and its subject. The subject of an active voice verb performs the action of the verb. The subject of a passive voice verb receives the action of the verb. But you know all that through your basic grammar. A grammar tricks. 
you may be surprised to learn that grammar can help you with your use of detail. However, the better you understand grammar, the more ways you can intensify the description in your poetry, just like that. They went from the color of the car to the make of the car, to the style of the car, to the rims, to the speakers. That was pretty intense, right? That was a uh, manipulation of grammar and increased the uh, description. For example, adjectives and positives, participles and absolutes are just four of the grammatical structures that can help you build poetic details. So if you wanted to get into those on a deeper way on your, on your own, you can do that, right? Well, look at that. We're done with the creative writing, reading, and the poetry. On to the questions, and we'll wrap this up for you. Creative writing questions. One, how should we think about the novel to take away our doubt in stopping us from writing? To think about it in an easy way. Two, list the elements that are key to every type of novel. They're listed there. So again, as I remind my old students and the new students, let's say that the elements are five. If you give me three, that's okay, but you're not going to get all the five points. If you list one or two, you know, even less. Uh, most novels contain which two types of characters? Only two types. Now list the five plot points. Again, give me all five. Which two things does dialogue do in a story? Two things that dialogue does. That's our creative writing questions. Now on to our poetry questions. Perhaps the most vital part of writing is the use of what? Look at the first part of the poetry reading we had today. Most vital, underline that. Two, depending on what type of emotion you want to express, which two concepts can you use? A lot of twos today. Make it simple. By describing visible things that you can see, details, it will prompt your reader to use what in return. Four, you use active verbs to create what? We just went over the active verbs right now. Might be fresh in your mind. The better you understand grammar, the more ways you can do what? And we just discussed that too. Remember, think about the car. And that should be easy peasy lemon squeezy. Okay, so that's it for our questions. Let me stop share. Go back, there I am. All right, folks. So that ends for our third week here. Uh, I shall see you soon, okay? So take care. Bye-bye.